Good evening and welcome to an Arts at 360 special presentation. I'm your host, Scott Burton. Tonight, with artists from 360 North's documentary Lineage, Clinket Art Across Generations, we'll explore Clinket Art and how it lives within our community today. I had the privilege of co-directing the film with the artist on my right. Please welcome my co-host, poet, storyteller, and filmmaker, Ishmael Hope. And I'll introduce the panel that is here as well. Um, this is Lily Hope Wushkundenda Ott. She's of the Tukhtain Tan clan. Um, she's a weaver. And my wife, my lovely wife. Um, here's Nick Galanin. Oh, yeah. This is uh, Nick Galanin. He's a, a very uh, well known multidisciplinary uh, clinket artist and uh, Unangan artist as well. Um, so Nick. Yehyatsin <laughs> is his Tlingit name. Uh, Lily is Wushkinden Da'at. Uh, this is Ricky Tegeman. He is of the Shlugnachari clan and his Tlingit name is Tleo Yeh. And he is a, is a weaver and also a multidisciplinary artist. And finally is uh, a cock, I call him my uncle, uh, Paul Marx Kinkaudinik. He's of the Shukachari clan. He himself is a, is a carver um, and also a, a clinket speaker and a culture bearer who has personally uh, taught me a tremendous amount. And we will start with our questions. So what I'm hoping is that we can just have a conversation, um, maybe not necessarily duplicate some of the things we went through and, and shared through the film, but maybe think a little bit about what's, what's next and just have that conversation. Um, and so I think it, I'd just like to start off with this question. Um, so throughout the film, you've been working, uh, you've been given glimpses of the kind of art that you've been working on, um, the projects and the journeys that you've been through. Um, and in a lot of cases, those, those journeys were very emotional um, and, and had a lot um, personally that you were invested in. Um, and we, we saw some of that. And so now, uh, what are some of the projects um, that you're working on? And actually, Scott, uh, he's a part of this panel too, so I'm hoping you might want to share something and we could just go down. Oh, wow, you put me on the spot. <laughs> Wow, this is, it's been a really great journey. I've been honored to work with you and these really talented artists. Um, and uh, wow, what's next? Short form for a while. Going to work on some short form pieces. Uh, in my own personal life, I uh, continue to work on my writing. Um, but uh, hope to get back to documentary making this. Uh, like I said, it's been a really great journey. Yeah. Okay. Jish. Really? Uh, well, it's been 20 days since the uh, cutting off the loom ceremony, and my loom is propped in a corner of my house, uh, calling to me, saying, are you going to warp me up yet? Are you warping me up yet? And I, I've got three robes that I really want to start, and I thought I was going to be a raven's tail weaver, and the chill cat weaving is, like, pulling on my heart. So next robe will, might be a merging of raven's tail and chill cat, might be a transitional robe, but uh, I really love the chill cat face and uh, whatever it is that I weave next will have m multiple chill cat faces woven into it. I've, I've got several projects going on uh, continually with music, uh, visual art and teaching. Um, recently a mentor fellowship, um, Mentor Apprentice Fellowship. So I'll be working with uh, Samuel Shikli Sh to mm. teach Chasing and Repose mm. over the course of a year. Um, so yeah, uh, subsisting right now, you know, summertime. So we're out getting all of our fish for, for our family. So. 
Sheesh. And an, and the June Bucks. Have you ever tried June venison? Oh oh oh, oh. June Bucks. Oh. Like a uh, buck in June. June. Okay. Is there oh, some special? Kind of <laughs> <laughs> is, there, <laughs> is there some special the, the kind of meat in Bucks of June? Am I or am I you just? Can't, just uh, you can't hunt them till August. Oh okay okay. <laughs> but because do you get like special? I'm just. Okay. Because I heard that you could actually, you could say, well, we're this for a potluck. Just joking. And you could get permission. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know this is Aaron Statewide, so <laughs> we follow the law. It was a joke. <laughs> All right. Come okay. on now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ricky. Um, I'm gearing up for, a, I'm part of a group show in Hawaii with the Asian Pacific American Center. Mm. Um, so I'm going to weave a garment out of pantyhose. What? And I'm uh, I'm cutting pantyhose into a spiral, so it's really long, and um, using a chill cat spinning method to, to create the warp and weft. That's Asian Pacific American, is that the center? Well, yeah, the center. Okay, so mm -hmm. that that so that includes the indigenous people, like on the Pacific Rim. Is that mm -hmm. is that the idea? Okay, yep. okay. Yeah. Wow. So I'm chopping up pantyhose and <laughs> spinning it on my thigh, and thinking of how I want to weave it together. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Paul. Uh, what are the kind of projects that you're working on? One, one thing we didn't have to, we, we didn't have a chance just because it's, you know, there's so much material that we got, but Paul had shared that he was working on a kutia that would be, uh, that's a totem pole, um, a smaller totem pole um, that would be uh, dedicated, um, as you explained, at a party uh, for your clan. Are there any other projects, uh, maybe not even just the visual art, the carving, but um, I know just from knowing you, there's always all kinds of stuff going on. Just to start off with uh, Ishmael and all of these fine artists here, it's always difficult for uh, myself to talk about myself, so it would mm. be nice to, it's nice to hear all of you and speak about your endeavors and your your work, and I, it's very inspiring. And look, listening and and feeling the spirit about what all of you do, it's such it's so inspiring to 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 hear that, because that's a that's a part that anyone or no a lot of people don't understand that spiritual connection that happens when you start delving into that art and. And, and just making yourself more receptive to the spiritual realm of the artwork. And when you're working on this artwork, you make sure that your mind is, is cleansed and pure and you have positive thoughts. Mm. Because whatever you're thinking about will go into that art form. And I know I'm not answering your question, but that's... <laughs> That's part of being Tlingit is that yeah, you, you want to lift up your fellow man, you want to lift up those that are doing the artwork. And it's, I feel like, you know, when I was sitting there watching this and this is, our ancestors are still here. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors are still alive and well inside of our, of all of you that are here. And <clears throat> to see some of the artwork my sister was showing, you know, those are very precious items. And my father did a few of those art pieces, and my father's nephew did some of the artwork there. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I've, I don't consider myself an accomplished artist or any master type art, but I do have, I, I believe at some point in my life it will come out. And it's, it's, it's something that's just in the making, kind of like, in the, you know, something's being created in my being. And right now I'm involved in, in the language and, I, and something is really happening within that realm is that there's a lot of things that are, are reawakening in my, in what has been dormant in my mind as far as our language. And the, has a lot to do with when we were talk when I talk with you, mm -hmm. Ishmael, and all the things, and it just kind of breaks loose a lot of things that have that were just stuck 
in the brain and not being used. And so when I listen to the older tapes now, I'm beginning to understand them a whole lot better. And, and, and it's because we're practicing and using the language. And Ishmael and I, each time we see each other, we mm -hmm. speak the language, we share with the language. And I'm always excited to see him because then I can practice and speak in the language and and, there's, and one because you know I one thing that really struck me is that he said I want to learn the language and I want to learn the lifestyle of being Tlingit and that really drew me to him and I said okay then which made me feel comfortable that I had I didn't have to hide anything from him mm -hmm. and that's you know a really something that we as speakers we don't care so much as far as or being Tlingit we don't care so much about people asking us questions but if we just sit down and start speaking with each other mm -hmm. a lot of the questions that they may have will be answered as we as being spoken like what's happening now <laughs> but anyway I'll stop I could talk and talk ah you know. uh, well and it's all good it really is and I think that's why it was pivotal to interview you, as well as just all the artists that we interviewed. I think one thing that's, that, that has happened is maybe because we're in Alaska um, with the resources and the funds and, and that type of thing, Northwest Coast art is a world-known thing. Uh, yet, playing it from our own perspective has not been um, shared that much. And so that's why, as we're just hearing right now, that perspective, the spirit of the art and how we raise up other people, just the way of, of being and knowing, having a chance to share that. So that's always good to hear. So Gnuchish. Just an addition is when Lily showed her, her, blank, her blanket and she talked about the spirit. Those, for, for me, the way I understand it is those faces, the different uh, even eyes and so forth. That's the spirit of the blanket. And when you don't have those things in, in any type of artwork that is Tlingit, then there's no spirit. If it's just a part of an animal and you don't put a spirit in there, then it's, it's different. But once you understand that there's a spirit in there and you see that face and then it comes alive to you. For, for us, I believe it's the way it is. For me, that's the way it is. Usually, if I look at an art piece that is done by Tlingit, I look for the spirit. And so I just wanted to add that, and I saw the spiritual robe, the Nalkane. To answer that, we say that our weavings are, you know, coming along and we're weaving across and doing different sections in the Chilkat blanket. and. Um, we can say that when the eyes and when the eyes specifically are woven of the central face or of the spirit face, if it's upside down, um, that that spirit does start to see us as well. That when our eyes are woven in the robe itself, it starts to look back at us. So, acknowledging that 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 mm -hmm. is that is a chill cat weaving belief as well. And to further that, that. As Nick mentioned in the film, um, they don't necessarily have to have eyes, but you can feel the spirit in the work without knowing exactly why you feel it in this particular piece and not in another one, depending on, yes, how the artist was feeling, but also their mastery of the work. Mm -hmm. So you can look at one artist and say, oh, there's the spirit, and you look at another one and you're like, something just not quite, right? And yes, you, you'll know, even those who are not so familiar with Northwest Coast art and form line, you'll know when you find that piece with the spirit alive in the work. Okay, Scott, would you? I was gonna say, uh, you just finished rock piles along the eddy. Back at you. Yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, 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 good question back you at me. just finished this film, what's next for you? Well, uh, Scott mentioned Rock Piles Along the Eddy. That's a book of poetry that just came out, um, my second book of poetry. And, um, it's very gratifying to get this kind of work out. I think my, my focus is along the lines of what 
the, pe the panelists are, are here are, are sharing um, just in a different way, not the, without the visual arts, but with the community, the spirit, the connection, um, and, and just deeply caring about sharing um, native voices. And that's something I'm, whatever artistically, and I should mention that Scott has um, spent hundreds and hundreds of hours because he has the technical expertise to, to do a film like this. We worked on it together, developing um, the concepts, developing the vision, um, planning it out, mapping it out, being there. And I would come in to the office, the KTO, upstairs uh, as much as possible, and we would talk it through and work it through on the spot. But Scott's really a person that, that really uh, put that work in there. Um, and so this is the kind of work you know, um, that I want to do, just, just grateful to do it. So, okay, why don't we uh, check in on this, the, uh, the next question we were hoping to ask. So just with the idea of what's next, where are we going, the, the themes of continuity and, and lineage, that was another thing. There's, there's so many excellent Clinket artists out there. Um, there are uh, many excellent Northwest Coast artists out there. And w this particular one, it, it's not necessarily who's a better artist or anything like that, although everyone's an incredibly fine artist. But our, our tack was seeing how continuities, how lineages of artists regenerate themselves um, and allowing them to share um, their stories and how they, you know, they, they, they create that regeneration that rebirth, that reincarnation, finding that spirit. Um, and so my question for the artists uh, at, right now is uh, just thinking about artists are visionaries in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, and I call you all visionaries. Um, that's, that's, that's how I'd compliment you. It, so if it, were, if it was up to you to generate the creative and social environment for Clinket art today. You know, we're in a certain situation, whether you talk about colonialism, Western, traditional, modern, those kind of things that get put out there. Uh, what would that look like for you? What kind of social and creative environment are you looking for as an artist? And I guess we'll, Scott has a lot of stuff to say, but. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think the film brought this up specifically when Paul Marx said it, that um, our clan houses and, and our language, I mean, coming back to our clan houses and the, the kuich and all that, when you say, when you envision your artistic community, I envision like 40 of us or, or 100 of us in a small village or in a small community maybe, and um, we're supporting each other with subsistence and supporting each other by watching each other's kids and and kind of returning to that um, all all for one or one for all kind of thing, where we're we're supporting each other's work um, at the ground level, and that there's so many of us working together. I mean, I, I every time I want to weave, I want to weave around other people. I want to pull in other weavers. I, um, my apprentice who helped me execute the final couple of weeks of my robe. I want, I, I want more people to weave with me, and I want this to be global. I want this to be, you know, bigger than my small community. But I want us to be together creating. <coughs> I don't know if that articulated exactly. Let's see. Um, I guess. I envision that it's not a single person creating, and that we can't create alone, correct? So, so I see this like, I envision at least 20 of us getting together and weaving together and, and supporting each other together, you know, tr yes, like, as I said, trading childcare, supporting each other in meals, and like, maybe there's two people assigned each day to cook food, and those other 18 people get to weave that day, and then the next day it switches so that we constantly have this artistic flow happening, and we never stop. Well, it just uh, something like that I was, I was, I was proud, I was personally a little proud of in the, in the video, is that it, it reinforced those, those values that that it's, it's, it's a community, 
it takes, it's not just one artist who comes up with something and then shows it to people, but it, 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 there's a whole warm community feeling context. And there's the land that, that Nick has um, very articulately mentioned many times about how, you know, um, subsistence and being in that land, being in place, you know, so I just, just very interesting thoughts. So. Yeah, uh, community is why we're here and what we're doing, so, <clears throat> and why we are able to. Um, I, th I think for, for, for me, having creative sovereignty is a necessity, especially with our histories that we've um, had in our communities with uh, just colonization and all of these other aspects of change in our culture. Uh, so I, th I think, um, yeah, I think that's a really important aspect of it. And also just the continual movement of raising our children around this space and them being comfortable and familiar with what the workshop is and with what the tools are and what, how to hold them and what, they're, what the s stories are that go along with the process or the harvesting or the techniques. Um, all, of those, all of those are uh, really important to contribution to culture opposed to consumption of culture. Consumption of culture is a, a very uh, colonial I idea, I, th I think, so. Um, Sheesh, that, that, it's an interesting point. Just, I think maybe all of our artists about uh, native artists that maybe we have little things that we remember when we were very young that our parents, our grandparents, our aunties and uncles exposed us, exposed us to that we didn't necessarily think about, and then just suddenly it, it blossoms and it makes sense. Yeah. And some Paul has talked about a lot about y you grow into it, you know. So I, I think that's a a key thought there. Chish. Uh, Ricky. Um, well, the question, I'm kind of thinking about it in terms of the project I'm doing with pantyhose and the point of cutting the, the pantyhose in a spiral to make it really long is I'm thinking about time not as linear but as a spiral and a lot of the work I think we do in the Native community is about relearning traditions and making the traditions part of our daily life. and. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of contemporary work is still, it references traditions a lot, even though it might be like completely contemporary. We still have that in us as native people and it goes into our work. Um, but as we go back and relearn a lot of that stuff, um, there's a lot of policy makers and a lot of systems in place that are, like how can we talk about decolonizing if we're still being colonized and policies are still being created to eliminate us? And mm -hmm. the, you know, those policies weren't, they were never subtle and I think history's kind of glossed over in a way and it's not subtle today, the kind of xenophobic stuff that's going on. So I think with time being a spiral we have to disrupt that oppression. So that's where I'd like to see things happening is mm -hmm. where people are aware of the policies that affect people and especially minorities. And What yeah. comes to mind is you, you, you made your points there is that talking about being embodied and, and finding that spirit and you know, um, a lot of times it could feel like uh, almost like a performance culture. Culture mm -hmm. can feel like a performance. But well, there's a certain point where you're in it mm -hmm. and it's alive. And, and I, that, as you were talking, it felt to me like that's a direct link, um, finding that spirit in the art, in the culture, mm -hmm. and decolonizing, changing the institutions, mm -hmm. you know, um, healing, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Simply being here even on the land in, right. in a space that where our, our ancestors were actively removed from or attempted, attempted removal is, is uh, I have to say, a form of resistance in its own, you know? And yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're inconveniently here, <laughs> you know? And uh, we're not going anywhere, right. you know? <laughs> Ricky, uh, if, if I may, you shared an image with us that seems appropriate uh, okay. to talk about uh, on the screen. Oh, yes. Us. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, um, this piece is called Dominant Culture, 
And it's um, leather that I, I spun like Chilcat Warp and um, I wove a handle in the Chilcat style. But this is about consent and our history of um, the colonization process. And, um, there's a lot of history of like forced sterilization of Native women and boarding school uh, abuse of every kind. And, um, and the show, this is from a, a solo show called Sexual Sovereignty, um, kind of the uh, reference a lot of histories of um, different communities. Chish. Mm -hmm. right. Oh. A lot of, probably a lot of oh, <laughs> big themes. Yes, it's, um, it's, a, it's a journey of uh, rediscovering who you are, who we are as a people. And I believe I could say that we are. We're rediscovering ourselves. And for myself, I, I really true-heartedly try to live as a Tlingit would live and try to conduct myself as a Tlingit would. So trying to stay to the, to the trueness of being Tlingit is, is one, I've, it's very enriching spiritually. It's very comforting because when you really understand who we are as a people, of how we are with each other. And that gives us, it creates a, a freedom in your spirit that you can trust one another without feeling that you're, that some may be jealous of you. Mm. Because all of these, these things in our past, I believe can re, re surface itself to us that we can live in harmony with the environment, we can live in harmony with, with each other. And through that harmony, our artwork is, is, becomes more freer and your imagination becomes more cleaner. And, you know, I, I think I'm, in, a lot of times I think I'm in a, in a different time frame than others. But I speak, I feel like I speak English very clearly though, but I think that's, mm -hmm. that comes from my, my teaching and wanting to learn. But if I were to just add to some of the history from where, I, where I've come from, my father here, he was, he was on that photograph there Right here, that's my father. He was born in 1902. And if he was still alive today, he'd be 115, 115 years old. And his father, my grandfather, was born in 1836. So you can see the span there. My grandfather, how many gra grandfathers were born in, in 1800s? You see what I mean? So. Uh, that culture is, I'm so still connected to that cultural aspect of who we are as a people. And sometimes I don't think a lot of people really understand that. Mm -hmm. And so when I see you guys and saying, hmm, these are very educated young men here, a young lady here, <laughs> and they speak English and their, their uh, demeanor is very intellectual, and I said, how am I going to sit with these guys? <laughs> but you know, so that's, I've learned to live with that, and I've learned to, to express the concepts and ideas that I feel mm -hmm. that are important to who we are as a people. And I think the more I express it, the more people begin to understand it. And I want it to be so because I see some people really not knowing the culture or the, the do's and the don'ts and, and not telling the stories that, of the raven stories correctly. To me, that's a danger for our people mm -hmm. because 
any story that we would tell is going to take us somewhere. And that's why our people would say, be sure and tell the story right. So it can take you places. It's like what Austin shared with me, my clan leader, and when he was, I was listening to him and being mentored by him. The stories I'm telling you, these stories are going to help you. It's going to be like a rope for you. Wherever you want to go, it's, that's where it's going to pull you to get there. And so these stories are not just stories. They're not just, oh, that's a cute story. Oh, that sounds so good. Mm -hmm. No, but there's so many values and important things in these stories. But, you know, so I'm not trying to belittle either one. This is just where we're at as a people. And I, and I really appreciate those that are really involved in the art. And I'm thankful for Ishmael for including me in, in this. And sometimes I get nervous in seeing myself and because I guess because, you, you know, I don't want to be up there in limelight. But anyway, so here's a big light shining in my face here. But, you know, I think it needs to be told. The stories need to be told. And the trueness of being Tlingit needs to be, needs to, needs to shine, needs to come out. And I think uh -huh. once that comes out, we can trust each other. And we don't have to be afraid of anybody else because we have a spirit that's continuing on is, and I liked what you said about, don't change this. Mm -hmm. And see, I see a lot of different people want to change and put in, because they're not studying the art. Mm -hmm. They're not studying the old ways. And so they're putting things, oh, let's put this there, let's put this there. And it's like, what is it? <laughs> you know, I mean, our people weren't that way. There was a rhyme and reason for everything. Every part is what, oh, I'm just going to put a filler over here, you know. No, it had to be a part of the whole art piece. But I can go on and on and on because I've studied, I've, I've listened, and I've, and I've tried to stay true to, to, to uh, being what our ancestors would want us to be. Jeez. And there's a saying that I asked my elder brother to, um, interpret for me there was a word I can't remember the word but he said that word is like every stone will be moved or overturned every little stone and he says that's you that's what he told me he said that's you you want to know and you want to promote the culture in the best way that you can and these are my words but it's just the words that were given to me so I, I guess what I'm saying is is what I'm living. Goodness I cheese. try to live it, not just talk about it. Mm -hmm. Goodness cheese. Well, as, as Paul was talking, I was thinking of his father, Willie Marks, Keet Yan he, there was He was a, a master carver during a time when, when uh, scholars t talked as if the art tradition was dead. But he was a master carver, um, brilliant, um, and highly overlooked by Northwest Coast art scholars. So I think that's part of what I was hoping in this film is to, to correct that narrative a little bit, to shine light a little bit more on people like Willie Marks, um, uh, Emma Marks, George Benson, um, Jenny Flanat. Uh, they were geniuses as far as I'm concerned. And, and so, Paul, you bring that up, that uh, calls to mind, uh, the, the, throughout the film, there was artists who talked about wanting to honor their elders, wanting to honor their teachers. I think it'd be very nice to hear from each of you about a teacher or, or more, um, a elder or a ancestor that, that inspires you and um, maybe brings some feelings to you about wanting to um, honor, wanting to um, make sure that they're done right by. Uh, well, the obvious one is my late mother. Um, 
I didn't know what she was teaching us, kind of like Nick mentioned, that we are exposed to these um, things early in life. And I was sewing buttons when I was seven and you know, spinning warp when I was 11 and um, hanging warp for her, helping her dye yarns. Uh, I mean, all of the tiny steps prior to weaving. And then when I t hit teenagerhood, um, I had to weave my first set of leggings and I hated it. And, um, but, but coming back to it, it as a young adult and putting my hands back in the warp and feeling that, I remembered the peacefulness that I was trying to avoid as a teenager. That, you know, I mean, it was, it was crazy. And then um, spending the, you know, um, almost a year with my mother learning to chill cat weave, uh, this first robe that I just finished. Um, and sometimes she was in town with me in the same zip code, and sometimes we'd FaceTime and I'd have my phone upright, you know, with my fingers moving across the warp, and she'd have her phone sitting on her leg and her fingers moving across her last robe. And it was um, amazing to have that a companionship doing that. <coughs> so, I can't not carry that on. And if I could split my time, I'd say, can I spend time with my family, 33%? Can I weave, 33%? And can I teach this, please, at 33%? So that when I'm gone, there's at least one of me who will hold those traditions and carry them forward as I'm trying. Yeah, sheesh. Sorry. That's one of the... Well, that, hey, you know, people die. Yeah, and humanity. You, and you miss you know, them. That's humanity, for and, sure. You know. And it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot to... Um, I was joking that my mother didn't um, weave her first robe until she was in her 40s. And I'm not quite in my 40s. And I have many more children than she did when she started her robe, and they're much smaller. Um, but I'm in that same space of my children are part of the thing. You know, they're coming and running through the warp like a like it's a veil to the other side, and um, I can't not do it. You know, you think that your life is going to take a certain trajectory, and I thought I was going to be a teacher. I was like this close to having a master's in elementary education teaching degree, and then my mother passes, and I'm like. Well, I'm not done with my robe, and I have to finish my all of these things, right? And then all of a sudden, it was like, I'm not supposed to be an elementary school teacher. I'm supposed to be a chill cat weaving teacher. So that was wonderful, and um, I hope that I can live up to the traditions that were left in my lap, and that I do, yes, leave someone or a few um, who can carry it into the next 200, 300, 5,000 years. Next 10, Jeez, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing is uh, there, there can be a lot of, um, like it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility to bear and just acknowledging that. And um, well, one, uh, it's, uh, Clarissa was in a, a special position um, by having a lengthy, lengthy amount of time with Jenny Clanat and Lily took the time to um, learn those lessons, and that's, that's very special. And it's also very wonderful that there are uh, still, you know, a number of weavers out there um, doing their work, uh, learning as much as they can, supporting each other. I see that, like at that, that clip we had of, that, that time we had with Nyla Reinhardt at her house was tremendous, just to see them um, collectively um, building up the art, so. Okay. So Nick, uh, you know, my father continues to be a mentor to me, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm very fortunate for. Um, and sometimes that mentorship comes out through stories and other <coughs> other histories. For me, this uh, involvement of this side of the culture was really also a way of um, understanding more about. Who, who I am and where I come from and uh, learning more about the histories and uh, of, of places. And uh, so yeah, uh, Will Burkhart as well, my uncle, um, Louis Menard. There's just too many to name, to be honest. Um, 
and and I'm continually learning as we go. So from all of you guys and just being here is 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 uh, um, humbling and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm taking it in and listening. So good cheese. And may yeah. I ask too? You mentioned your father, Nick. I know he's uh, a great musician. Oh yes, yeah, and dog. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so are you. I think everybody knows that Nick's music is yeah, featured I, prominently yeah. in the documentary. Um, can you talk a little bit about your connection with your dad and the music? Yeah, and you know, uh, George Benson was a musician as well. Oh yeah, um, I think it's it's uh, when he got the funk and the soul. He got <laughs> <laughs> It's got to come out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I don't. I don't compartmentalize with walls and barriers my creativity. I, I don't think it's a necess necessity, but a lot of times the audience will. And um, for me, it all moves together. So the visual art, the the cultural work, the the music. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's real important to me. So, uh, yeah. Well, I I did appreciate the the added all the, a tonality mm -hmm. that I think as artists we were looking for in the film to have so much of your music in there, and even if it's not oh contemporary or traditional, mm -hmm. like what you're saying, the the barriers. It it still it felt like this is someone yeah. that uh, grew up in Sitka, like I did somewhat, and and a similar generation and that feel and that. That, that vibe was, was there, and that's it part of the culture, it, too. It comes from the land and from mm -hmm. being here. And, and you, you wake up and you see the landscape and the weather change and the, the extremes and um, sometimes the sun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ricky? Um, I really enjoyed how the film you know, paid a, a tribute to Terry and Clarissa. I just think it's really special that you had that time with them, you know, because they both had a really aggressive cancer and they died within like weeks of each other. Days. Days, Days of each other. Yeah. yeah, that was rough. It's been a rough time for Weavers. Mm -hmm. And um, I, both of them were really generous teachers for me. Um, I spent a lot more time with Clarissa, obviously, but I had opportunities in Anchorage um, with Terry and her sister Shelly Laws. Laws. Um, they would teach me all about mountain goat wool <clears throat> and just like every single thing they knew about it they would they were so generous um, sharing their techniques and how to process the wool and Terry was really a scientist mm -hmm. and a historian and she always said there's no clinket word for art Mm -hmm. You know, she was creating scientific documents and historical documents. Mm -hmm. And um, something Della Cini's said about weavers and the weaving community is um, that weavers were like the warp, were like the pieces that hang off the frame. Mm -hmm. And everything we make is like the weft that connects us. Mm -hmm. And when, when we lose people, like Clarissa and Terry were really like Clinket National Treasures. You know, so it's going to take a while for us to recover from that. But also in the beginning of the film, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but there was the Kuik footage where you guys were all dancing mm -hmm. and you're activating these things that we make. Mm. That's such a big point of why we make this stuff is for that time together to acknowledge the dead. And I'm glad you had the fire dish footage to feed our ancestors. And I remember Dick Downhower once said, the whole idea behind that ceremony is when we care for each other who are still here, mm -hmm. we're caring for the dead. Goodness, cheesh. So. That's one thing about weaving, and I, I'm, I'm, I am pleased that the weaving was prominently featured in the film, is that we're, we're talking about with it being danced in and, and with mm -hmm. it being, it embodying something and, and I think it's a different way of looking at art than a lot of Western art, which can be all about how complex and dazzling visually the c design is, which is a big part of it, mm -hmm. but, but not, not everything. So I, I think right. some of the stuff that you're talking about, um, and I, I think a lot of the points that are being made right now, um, spirit, embodiment, and, and honor, and all these, these themes you know, coming out. Mm -hmm. So 
Achak. Oh, goodness, Jeesh. I was looking at the timer. And says, <laughs> I guess I got <laughs> 10 minutes. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, I, if I can remember, I think you were talk, asked about who is your hero in the art. Mm -hmm. You know, I know my dad, he was, he was such a, he was such a calm man, but then he knew how to work with wood so, so very well. I mean, he could take a piece of wood, or just a block of piece of wood, and then bam, 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 bam. And pretty soon the form is there with, it just seemed like minutes. And that's one thing that he taught my brother Jimmy, is how to get rid of the wood fast. And then they get with the axe, and that way you save a lot of energy than trying to do it with a small knife or whatever. He taught him how to use the, use an axe and the adze, where it was you know, they were very efficient with those tools. And so my dad, you know, I I probably crawled around in his carvings, you know, shavings, and watching and and learning. And I can remember when I was in, I think it was uh, second grade, I carved a totem pole and I was copying what they did. And then I got a driftwood and made the wings, but the wings were like different colored in the wood. And I took it to school and that was my first art piece I sold. And my teacher bought it. Oh, whoa, yeah, yep. <laughs> what are you doing with that? What are you gonna do with it? I was, uh, I don't know. He says, are you selling it? And he says, hmm, money. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, sure. He says, well, how much you want for it? I said, oh, I'll take $1.75 for it. Oh. Mm. That was a lot of money then. Mm -hmm. I could buy a lot of candy with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but his nephew, which was his, sis his sister's son, David Williams, he was invited to demonstrate his artwork to the queen. And so he was, that art took him all the way to wherever the queen is. <laughs> and, you know, and so I've seen some of his artwork and there, I really would, if even if I could just get part of how he carved, would be a big accomplishment for me. But you know, they, when my father was asked to re-duplicate re, uh, some art pieces from from a tachit, from this from the Dachtentan, mm -hmm. the howling wolf, and the woman in the mountain, mm -hmm. he didn't want to do it. He really resisted, and they came to him. If you do this, it'll make your children proud, and so. My sister Florence tells me when he started, he stuck the piece of wood in front of him. And I think he said, uh, and he would just stare at it. And I think he said it took him four or five years. Mm. But when he, you know, he looked at it, studied it, and just sat there looking at it. And then finally, boom, he just started working on it. And those art pieces are, you know, one of the, and that ooh now. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the Chilkat blankets and stuff, and I think my sister, I think she coined this phrase is that art's in motion. Mm -hmm. So when our art is in motion, whether it's a staff or, or in, so that is, you know, really important for because it, it's, it's what it's doing in the arts that we're doing, it lifts up our ancestors. You can. We're lifting the ancestors up mm -hmm. of what they've instilled in us to create these things. And we honor, by honoring our ancestors, we honor ourselves and we honor our future generations. And so to maintain that integrity of our art is, I think is very important. And before anything else, I'd like, to, this is done by my mother. Mm. And when she did her beadwork, 
she prayed before she started. She asked the Lord to show her the colors to use, everything. And mm -hmm. she said, when I do my work, I want it to be around in a, 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 for a long time. I don't want it to fall apart after two or three years. Mm -hmm. This was done probably just shortly after the first celebration, which is 1982. And it still looks pretty fresh. Okay. <laughs> you know, not one bead is loose. Mm -hmm. and, and so she wanted it to last, but then I wanted, what I really wanted to show you, there's that little face in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit of it. And so that's real important. And the reason why this, and they use all these nice colors is because of what Yeh done for us. Mm-hmm. And then the way I understand and what I've read and what I've studied and listening to the elders is that was the creator's name was Yeh. It wasn't a bird. It was the creator, Hashagenya, was and, uh, by putting himself in there to a kritka, which is a hemlock needle, and the girl swallowing it, then she became pregnant, and mm -hmm. then the creator came, was born, and so they gave him the name. We're going to name him Raven. So they're going to cheese, Hechisach, we gauk, tuchu, and a kicha. Okay. You say, yeah, thank you for listening. I, I know that the time is running out. So I think we have a short amount of time, maybe 30 seconds apiece. Um, for this last question. I know it's a big question, so, um, but that's just time. Um, I think w one thing we're hoping to do is Clinkit Art, I think, is maybe generally misunderstood um, by the broader public. And, and what hopefully this documentary starts to do is to share it a little bit more from the people's perspective. So how would you envision uh, Clinkit Art being shared, being talked about, how, what kind of things, how, how would you correct the record if there are any misconceptions out there? Ms. Lulu, you want to pass it along? Go ahead. <laughs> well, well, first we're going to need to get the record back right. from all okay. these institutions. <laughs> mm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think that's a great starting point. <laughs> Take mm -hmm. inventory. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I mean, we're, we're, we're moving and and we'll always be doing so with with what, what, what this generation of um, artists up here right now and and the children behind that. So I think it's I think it's still going and that's that's great. Cheesh. Thirty seconds isn't a ton yeah. of time, but um, there's been times when I've gone to museum um, archives and collections and looked at weavings and it's it's kind of challenging because it's like seeing human remains that's how it feels when you open a drawer and there's a chill cat blanket it's like seeing the bones and it's sitting in the dark alone all the time and so when you said we need the record back we literally like yeah our stuff is all over the world and we don't fully have control over how our story is being told, and your movie addresses that and takes ownership Sheesh. of that. And it's part of the solution. So I think that's a good way to move. Cheesh, Hak, or Lily? Oh, oh. oh. It's real important for us to really reach back or even things that have been, have been wronged, and how do you change that, I think is when we continue to try to do the right things and continue to try to keep in that, that proper, and keep in the proper perspective of who we are and what we stand for and what we believe our ancestors wanted us to be. And I believe that's, when that's what I hear when you're talking, you're meditating on that mm -hmm. ancestral spirit. And so I think that's how, one way we'll continue to be who we are as a people is it to make maintain that trueness of our artwork. Yeah. So you have a final it's, thought? It's the reaching 
It's the reaching back and holding up the traditions of our people. <coughs> and it's the reaching forward and maintaining the integrity of those teachings as we pass them to our next generation. All right, Scott. Yes. I would like to just keep following people around with the camera. <laughs> What's that? I just want to keep following people around with the camera. Can I, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be there. And thank you. That is all the time we have for tonight. Thank you to the artists. Uh, thank you to your sharing your beautiful stories and to the people that were um, in the film as well who may be watching this. Um, they shared some amazing things. The Alaska Humanities Forum and KTOO, which pro provided hun really uh, thousands of dollars in in-kind donation to make this happen. 360 North, yeah. 360 North Cheers. as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. This program is supported in part by a grant from the Alaska Humanities Forum and the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal agency. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. <laughs>